Honestly, I don't think I even wanted to kill him. After that, we were on the run, and it was very hard for Annie. So I put him on a wagon train to Missouri, and I said I'd be right behind him. The sense of euphoria I'm feeling watching this delightful edition of Destruction is a magic I once reserved for the MCU. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. But as it is, times have changed, and where some things have reduced to a state of decay, The Walking Dead proves there is still life after death. As this week exceeds the depths I hope to explore, pulled on our heartstrings a little bit, and almost quashed the concerns I had regarding our secondary cast of interlopers, as we begin the second act. We open with a flashback to some time before the events of the show, with Ginny wandering in the woods in search of something, and runs directly into Negan, rocking a Stetson. And I'm dead, sexy. Negan accosts her for running off when he's sworn to protect her, and realises that she's lost a toy dinosaur. After the pair were assaulted the previous night, and they find the guy who did it, zombified and impaled on a tree branch. Can't be that easy. And by the end of the episode, though, we see Negan teach her to whistle in case of an emergency where she's lost her voice for now, and Negan returns the toy to her, realising it was in the thief's bag. We cut back to Ginny in current day, arriving at the Manhattan shorelines, though, where she sails over continuing the search for Negan. Shortly after this, we see the survivors dissecting a deer for dinner, whilst revealing how they survived in Manhattan all this time, having been kids when the outbreak started, and witnessing the military destroying all the exits in and out of the city. And they explain that for years, things went by undisturbed until the Croat's arrival, where things steadily became worse as he's been applying Negan's tactics of recruitment and any resistance has been squashed and chased down ever since, with the Croat's influence steadily swallowing up most of the city's residents. Well, that's fucking... Not good. We then shift to Maggie and Negan discussing the potential entry points into Madison Square Garden that the Croat has claimed as his sanctuary where he's returned with Pauly. And Negan explains that the tactics the Croat's using are ones that he's familiar with and without divulging it was him, tells the survivors that several communities revolted against their own oppressor at one time and they won, leading them to believe that it could be done if they get the numbers together. Shortly after this, it's revealed that one of the survivors, Tommaso, was a prisoner to the Croat at one point and managed to escape from his imprisonment, but vowed never to go back. However, Maggie wants the details of his escape to formulate their plan for infiltration. He starts to map it out and explains what the conditions were like and assumes they'd be similar now as they were then, but Negan tells him that the prison would have been relocated to prevent something like this happening again. Amaya asks how he'd know that, and Maggie confesses that Negan knew the Croat and understands what he's doing here, so Negan Negan will act as bait for having his ears shot off when the Croat tried to leave the saviors. Can't be that easy. It's that easy. Another survivor named Luther, who's been wary of Negan throughout this episode, dismisses Maggie's mission, feeling it only serves her here and will get them killed to save Herschel, who he believes is already dead. You dick! Negan steps up and demands that they revisit this again later, while we shift to the Croat discussing his history as a researcher on alternative energy with Pauly, where he explains the walkers decomposing bodies can be repurposed for liquid methane that can power the electrics across the city. Couldn't have done that earlier. I hate you. Creating a sustainable energy source, given the dead are all around them, and as he's about to tuck into a meal, he spots a maggot inside of his meat and reprimands the server, claiming he tried to poison him. And for that, he makes him swallow Pearlie's handcuff key, then bashes his skull in and throws him over a balcony. I don't know. I think that's a bit dodgy, mate. We then move back to Maggie, who's going through old images and keepsakes belonging to her loved ones, when Negan approaches her with a new hat for Herschel, remembering he used to wear one a lot when they met when he was a kid. Maggie is initially dismissive of Negan's attempts at peace until he comforts her with the knowledge that he understands what she's going through, where before meeting Ginny, Annie, their son Joshua, and himself held up in a cabin outside of New Babylon, where one day Annie went to make trades for supplies when she was assaulted by a gang of five. Upon returning to Negan, he did what we know he would do, given how he feels about things like that and takes out the five men, answering the details of his arrest warrant about the murder of a new Babylon magistrate and four marshals from episode one. 
And after this, they were then on the run until Negan put Annie and Joshua on a train headed far out from Babylon and hasn't a clue where they are since. After this, we see the survivors joining hands and laying a token of their past on the table as they pray before heading into battle for the next day, presumably being their last meal. Maggie joins in with this and as they prepare to eat, Pearly readies to fight as the Croat feeds him some methane to weaken him, then chains him inside of an octagon cage, where the servant is placed in with him, now zombified, and Pearly must kill it to retrieve the key he swallowed earlier to unlock his handcuffs. However, when he does escape, Pearly then must prove how resourceful he is by using his boot to kill a trio of walkers as a sign of strength. And our final scene between the pair ends with the Croat explaining how he lost his family before meeting Negan, and felt he found a new family there but instead learned how to become a survivor and demands to know what Pearly's hiding, finding a letter inside of his boot from his brother, and Pearly confesses why he's in Manhattan and shocks the Croat by saying the name Negan. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. And we wrap up with Negan attempting to find a weapon in the kitchen when Luther demands that both he and Maggie leave now as he won't allow his people to die for them and finds Negan's wanted poster deeming him a threat. And after an intense exchange between the two, Negan is almost crushed to death by Luther until he uses a cheese grater to escape him and Luther falls base of the skull first onto a tap, killing him. <laughs> And whilst this transpires, Maggie retrieves the dinosaur toy from another member of the group returning from scouting and goes to burn it, unaware that Ginny is watching from a distance, concerned that her toy is hers. So, this episode is packed to the rafters with meaningful exposition, detailed recounting without detailing the events themselves, and genuinely heartfelt scenes bringing the gravitational pull toward Negan as it now seems this show is no longer about Maggie. From Ginny's attachment to Maggie's demands, Pearlie's intentions, the crow arts revenge and now possibly the survivor's retaliation, everything is falling into place for Negan's actions, both good and bad, receiving hefty reactions. It all makes sense now. I fucking love this episode as it's oozing with knowledge, history, consequence, setup and payoff, and truthfully has some of the best writing I've seen for some time, with even the gore becoming purposeful rather than self-indulgent displays of bloodshed that would have served to only get Homelander off at this point. Our boy has stirred up quite the shitstorm for himself this time by confronting an old adversary and an assortment of new adversaries whilst trying to balance his burgeoning relationship with Maggie and duty to Ginny, making this an absolute treat to watch. Negan is, in my opinion, the best written character in this universe, and coupled with the charismatic performance from Jeffrey Dean, you have a clear win with this one, and I feel like the writers are truly starting to understand what they've had on their hands all this time. The dynamic between Negan and most characters is pure magic in this universe, but the rich, uneasy relationship he has with Maggie, and that psychological battle he's forcing her to undergo with every action he makes for the greater good, is absolutely gripping. Shut it! Their conversations each episode have been explosive, but here, with Negan offering the hat for Herschel whilst Maggie holds the drawing of Glenn, is particularly profound, as if the pair are listening to Negan together at this moment, and a defence of him later while revealing his connection to the Croat is fantastic. And to have Maggie place the picture of Glenn on the table later as an offering for protection and thought, you could say is almost her symbolically saying she's willing to make peace until the scene with her contemplating burning Ginny's toy, which I take as her first steps into morally dubious waters, where she knows that toy belongs to Ginny, and if Negan sees it, he'll know she's here, which will then shift his priorities to suddenly retrieving the girl and getting her to a safe location, thereby compromising Maggie's mission to finding Herschel. Now, I wouldn't say this makes Maggie a villain necessarily, but to throw Ginny under the bus with no clue as to how to protect herself, proven with the walkers earlier in this, means that she's endangering the girl, something I never assumed that she would actually do, given this mission is about finding another child. But she made her feelings clear to Negan earlier by mentioning that everyone she's cared for is inside of a carry case. But my other fear is this could inform us of what she might have planned for Negan. She's always threatened Negan with his life but is yet to actually deliver on it, so what could it mean for her character if the writers decide this is when she'll do it? We know Negan's only there because he owes her but also his connection with the Croat. This would deliver on a long-standing desire she's had to see her husband's murderer punished and, if he's just left there, she wouldn't even be directly responsible for his capture. However, 
However, what could this mean for Ginny too, if this was an action she would follow? If Ginny follows them next episode to the stadium, based on the trailer footage for next week, it will bring a child into the mix for the sake of saving another child. Which, in my mind, would fully transition Maggie into a more villainous character. And for whatever progress Negan feels he's made with the Widow could be completely eviscerated should Negan find out what she did. And I'm just spitballing here, but if Negan or anyone else manages to destroy the Croat and something happens to Ginny because of Maggie's actions here, and he finds out that this has happened, he has the intelligence and the gift of Gab, plus enough resources and people around for Negan to take control once again. Holy shit. Returning Negan to his past, though I can't imagine he'd stoop to that low again, but would instead go after Maggie as a personal vendetta. And even among all this, we can't forget the answer of what became of Annie and their son Joshua, which served to answer why he's on the run for the New Babylon authorities to begin with. A situation of which I feel was written to make Negan's newfound balance over his two personalities suddenly more strained, as he wants to become a better example of what humanity should be in this time and proves capable of that during the flashbacks with Ginny in his relationship with Judith, calling on his past as a high school gym instructor, so in this he wants his son to learn not to become the person that he is, but the ceaseless brutality of this world they're in continually forces him to resort to that uncompromising vicious instinct again and again, where you think the man has simply given up trying but is a father and husband ripped away from his family due to an unending cycle of violence people are repeatedly pushing on each other and just wants to reclaim what he lost. I want my family back. Okay! And I can't say I would have done any differently either to what Negan did to the Magistrate and the Marshals for their actions against Annie, but it begs the question here, what does this mean for Pearlie? Pearlie's mission is restoring order and structure to society once again, made clear by his actions and exposition in Episode 1 and Hunt for Negan are all noble intentions, but how will he feel knowing what actually went down? A sight we'll possibly see, but working for another state of corruption is likely not what he signed up for, and given the archaic times we now live in, he won't know Negan's reasoning for their murders until they meet, which I think could be the catalyst for change to his character, assuming he finds out the details of why Negan did what he did. Would this change his adherence to law and maybe he overhauls the authoritarian presence in Babylon, or will he go on to become another survivor that joins Maggie and Negan, maybe believing that they have the better intentions for the world as opposed to the likes of New Babylon and the Croat? It's hard to say right now, but Pearlie has just moved up in my estimations, proven to be a very capable fighter when needed, and highly resourceful under pressure. The cage fight was awesome and the visual expressions from Gaius Charles were brilliant and did more for his character than engaging in conversation however well he delivers dialogue. Then I'll end here with the Croat. The Croat has a degree of empathy added to him here, as you understand the man has equally lost as much as he's gained in life with the void of losing his family filled with the words of Negan in his hour of despair. The context we're given helps elevate the conflict between the two now, and I can't wait to see that fight play out. The intelligence he possesses is incredible, being able to determine that the decomposition of walkers could be repurposed for a style of fuel makes him rather dangerous competition against Negan, especially combined with Negan's lessons in manufacturing a society and breaking people in, being exemplified here with the server's execution and Pearlie's torture. He truly stood out in this one and was presented as a legitimate threat going forward, though I have some reservations about his time in the show, seeing the assault on the garden begins next week, with tensions rising high and possibly leading to the Croat meeting his maker sooner than we might expect, which could make a breezy finish allowing time for Maggie and Negan to figure their shit out, but I wonder what could happen if he does get struck off the list this soon. Anyway though, if it wasn't clear, this was a fantastic balance over gore, exposition, character development, and lore-abiding information that steadily progresses events at a breezy pace. And I truly believe this show has exemplified what the franchise should have been from the beginning. All killer, no filler. I had fears last week that we were starting to introduce too many elements and bloat an otherwise limited series, but alas, we have our core group, with all the moving components being tied to Negan. And overall, this show has truly found its stride over anything we've received previously in the flagship series. And and I'm sat here eagerly waiting for the final three installments of this televised cinematic masterpiece that looks to be closing the curtains on a destructive duo once and for all. That's going to do it for me this week though everybody, thank you so much for stopping by. Please be sure to leave a like and subscribe for the rest of my coverage and hit the bell to be notified of anything else I do. And until next week everyone, take care and I will see you soon.